So you went over a little bit. I'll just summarize it so before I ask the question. So yeah. you have um, cold atoms and you pull them out individually using uh, laser tweezers mm -hmm. and um, probably with some very precise optics that allow you to focus mm -hmm. yeah. sufficiently on the single atom. You group them and entangle them into these logical qubits, yeah. right? And then, uh, so two two questions. One is, you're saying that you actually have to interact with that logical qubit in some way to do the error correction. Mm -hmm. Physically, what is that interaction? So how do you, you have this uh, grid, is it a 2D or 3D grid of atoms? Mm -hmm. How do you interact with it in order to do the error correction? And then I have a follow-up question as well. Yeah, so what you, what you do is you typically have two types of qubits. One, which is so-called data qubits, where the information is preserved. That's one group. And then there is another group, which sometimes are called ancillary qubits. So these ancillary qubits... And this this is a physical qubit or a... These logical? are physical. These are physical, physical qubits. That's all within one logical qubit. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, exactly. So this is... To make one logical qubit, generically, you need certain qubits where you store information redundantly, encode it redundantly. Then you, you use another group of physical qubits, which do these checks. You know, they do these checks to check, to see if the information is if errors have been made, mm. basically. And what you need to do, you need to bring this second group, it needs to interact with this first group in a certain way. It's actually quite non-trivial way. It should not be just one-to-one. -one. So typically, one ancillary qubit actually kind of sort of touches multiple, you know, data qubits, you know, and then afterwards you measure the these, ancillary. these ancillary qubits, and that's what introduces a certain linearity. That's what stabilizes. Sorry, so when you measure the ancillary qubits, yeah. they give you back, in the end, the one or a zero, right? Exactly, exactly. And what hap how does that one or zero do the error correction? So this, you know, this gives you a pattern mm. of what's so-called, you know, stabilizers. It basically gives you a pattern of flex. Okay. So in a simple way, you could say if no error has occurred, all of these ancillary qubits should be zero. Mm. If one of them goes to one, it's like a flag lights up. It says, oh, the issue. error occurred, and it tells you where it occurred. And you can then And you can go and, it. for example, flip it, or sometimes you can just record that error occurred and keep it, you know, keep track of it and basically in a software, correct it in a software. Mm. Okay, yeah. that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. A follow-up question, just physically, because from watching your, your talk, I, I don't remember where you gave this talk, but you show the qubits kind of uh, being overlapping exactly. physically. So you're able to move one group over another exactly. to create kind exactly. of a all-to-all -all interaction. Exactly. Don't the traps overlap when you do this? Like the optical traps? No, we never actually, we designed this move such a way that traps never overlap. Yeah. And they come close, but they never, never touch each other. What's the requirement? Like, like how how close can the traps come? So, so like, I mean, a lot of these things are kind of diffraction limited, so they should be, you know, mm -hmm maybe kind of couple of micrometers from each other, but you know, basically... But the atoms can interact at that distance atoms, before that's, the trap. Exactly. Because so that's we, very lucky, right? That well, exactly. That's key. That's key. That's a key yeah. idea. Okay. That's a key innovation of this Rydberg blockade. That's what enables you to... In fact, it enables you, like kind of at a very kind of deep technical level, this Rydberg blockade is, an, is, um, is a process where by exciting atoms, you basically have two situations. One is when atoms are far away, they basically don't feel each other's present. But if the atoms are sufficiently close within the so-called Rydberg blockade radius, which is typically a couple of micrometers, there the interactions to the reading order infinite. So you never can excite more than one atom. And that is actually the way how to make this interaction also being digital, you know, which actually allows us to do, for example, you know, multiple operations in parallel with very little calibration, with very few calibration nodes, you know. And the idea is indeed, indeed, so what you what happens, so basically this movie that what you've seen is a basis for something which is called transversal gate operations. It actually turns out to be very efficient way to uh, do operations, quantum operations between logical qubits. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you do there is you just take one group of atom, pick it up, bring it such that the atoms sit nearly on the top of each other, but not quite touch it, touch it. Then you just shine one, shine one pulse of light, which actually entangles them all in parallel. Hmm. You know, and then you, you move back. 
Why does one pulse of light entangle them all in parallel? Because they're all they are they're all basically positioned properly. They're positioned just to be to be oh, okay. you know, so yeah, yeah, so it's kind of very special. I, and okay, like can I can explain why this is special. Yeah. And it's special for the following reason. So in, in this logical qubits. Maybe just just so yeah, I have yeah. a picture in my head, and I think probably everybody has the same question. When you say one pulse of light, is that light hitting all the atoms? It's it hits all light? atoms. Ah, so it's like a, it's like a spread laser. Exactly, beam exactly. It's, it, we actually usually will in fact illuminate them from the side. Ah, you know? Okay, okay. But so the reason why this so-called transversal, so what I described in technical terms is called transversal gate operation. The reason why this is special is the following. So in logical qubits, quantum information is delocalized over groups of these atoms. So normally, to make quantum gate between them, you have to make, basically, you have each atom on the left side, you have to, or each physical qubit on the left side, have to somehow know about what each atom on the right side is doing. And so usually, this is like in conventional approaches, for example, something called topological quantum computing, you know, surface code, you know, some of you have heard about it. So what it effectively, what you need to do, you need to somehow, you know, like swap the operation between all of these big chunks of qubits, you know, or in some other way, you can basically need to like take, you know, these like excitations and this topological, you know, uh, quantum error correcting all these anions, these exotic particles, you know, you need to basically braid, you need to move anions between like you know from right to left all the way and this include it it's a it's a lot of work right there's a lot of kind of operations so basically by doing this You're parallelizing all we parallelize and we actually in more moreover when you bring the atoms like on the top of each other and do this gate what happens is that you know if for example one of these physical qubits was faulty right in doing this gate it can also affect the other one but because we don't like we don't sort of completely wipe this you know one thing around the other you know if this guy is faulty it will produce a fault in a very well defined place it turns out to be super useful information in terms of how do you decode the errors mm -hmm. so eventually you measure this ancillas you figure out oh they are occurred here but in this if we do this this uh like uh, logic gates, you know, uh, qu you know, quantum gates between logical qubits in this kind of transversal way, it turns out that by actually, you know, measuring these syndromes, by measuring these flags, we actually have a lot of information. Not only that there is where where is a curve, but also how it propagated. And, and I think it's a very important insight, which actually will, you know, you know, we will. It's of both fundamental and also very important practical significance. You know.